I'm very, very, very happy to, uh, to say welcome to our first webinar speaker of this seminar series, uh, Victor. Victor has been really, really nice to uh, accept doing an online talk instead of um, visiting us here, which has been the, a, a pity, but well, this is how it is now. And I was telling him that I'm sure that the, our seminar room probably was fully full for his, um, for his talk today, but the things uh, are like this now. And I guess we had to be used to having the presentations like this. The, the good thing is that you can listen to fantastic people like today's speaker just from your home or your lab or whatever you are doing. Um, so uh, Victor, probably many of you know him and um, he, I, I I'll tell, tell you a little bit about his professional trajectory first. So he, he was born in Asturias, as many of our uh, eminent past and current PIs at the CBM. And he studied chemistry then at the Complutense, Universidad Complutense here in Madrid. And then did a PhD with Jesus Avila. I'm not sure if he was already at the CBM uh, then. No. Oh. Uh, then he moved to the States and um, joined the, um, he was first a postdoctoral post fellow in molecular genetics at Harvard University. Then he joined the faculty at Johns Hopkins sorry, University and has been a professor at Emory University since 2007. So he has done most of his uh, career in, in the States and uh, he has uh, obtained numerous of, uh, awards and prizes. And uh, for example, among them, he's Howard Hughes Medical Institute professor. He's a member of the Spanish Royal Academy of Science and uh, of the uh, USA National Academy of Science as well. I really like um, one of the prizes that he got that I I'm, I'm uh, reading it uh, exactly as it is, is the Old Gold and Sable Award that he obtained in 2007. And uh, listen, because, because this is fantastic, is for being the faculty member making a most, most profound impact on a student's lives. I thought that was beautiful. And I'm certain you will understand very soon why was that when you listen to his highly, highly uh, engaging presentation today. So Victor, um, long-standing interest is gene regulation and chromatin organization. And in particular, his, his lab is interested in, in the mechanism by which chromosomes are organized in the 3D nuclear structure and uh, how this is this influenced gene expression or is influenced by gene expression. They have done uh, outstanding contributions to several fields, probably the most known is that because he was the discoverer of one of the most famous now architectural proteins, CTCF. So architectural proteins are, um, uh, are those group of proteins who may or enable chromatin loops by making contact with different parts of the genome and generate uh, loops in which uh, enhancers or promoters are, yeah, are close together. And uh, they show that these architectural protein change during development and in different cell types. So also this, the, these loop chains and the regulation of the of gene expression change during development and uh, uh, change all the, the expression patterns that ens um, ensure us uh, in cell fate. And uh, most recently, they have been shown how the um, environmental factors and even the, the chemics, chemists of, of the ambient can change the location of these architectural proteins and, and, the, and the loops that they form and how these changes can be uh, transmitted to the offspring, so they can uh, these these epigenetic changes can in, be inherited in um, uh, through, during generations. And uh, he is going to talk about uh, that today to us. So yeah, I'm not saying anything else now. I'll try to put my my camera off. And uh, as you know, during the talk or even at the end of the talk, you can write your questions on YouTube, and I will. Uh, Tell that to Victor because he's not seeing the YouTube. If you have um, any question that you want to be answered during the talk, uh, he, he said he's happy of doing that. So just, uh, just uh, write it straight away. So thank you very much, Victor, again. Uh, it's a pity that uh, you are not here. Uh, it would be great for us uh, having your presence and being able to discuss with you. 
this is uh, the second best and uh, I'm very grateful that you, you managed to have uh, time for us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maria. Can you hear me okay? Can you hear me okay? No? I think so. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> I think it's fine, yes. Okay. Um, so, um, as, as Maria said, um, I, I actually um, I, uh, made a mistake when I, I told her that I was in the Centro de Biología Molecular. I started working with Jesús Ávila and the group of uh, Margarita Salas and Eladio Viñuela when they were still in, in the uh, Consejo, in, uh, in the in Velázquez, in La Calle Velázquez. Uh, but then in my second year uh, in graduate school, we moved to the old uh, Centro de Biología Molecular. And uh, when Maria invited me to, um, to come and give a seminar, I thought it would be great because I've never been in, in the new one. Anyway, um, today, I would like to share with you um, some relatively new results uh, that um, we don't quite understand uh, completely, um, but um, I would like to share them with you. So, um, the issue that we are interested in is the mechanism of transgenerational inheritance. <clears throat> so, there are a lot of examples both in humans and in, and in mice and in other model, model organisms, um, showing that uh, changes in the environment, and what I, what I mean by that could be the diet, it could be you know, hunger, it could be exposure to different chemicals, um, changes in the environment in one generation can be transmitted uh, to other generations and so is whatever epigenetic, so the, the idea is that the environment um, causes an epigenetic um, alteration and this epigenetic alteration in the germline is maintained and, uh, during fertilization and is passed on to uh, subsequent generations. Um, so <clears throat> let me, um, show you the type of environmental perturbation that we use in order to study the phenomenon. So what we want to understand is really what it does the environment do to the germline uh, that can be transmitted from one generation to the other. So what we do is we take pregnant female mice and we expose them to bisphenol A, which is something that is present in, in plastics, for example. So you, you can see um, plastic bottles that say um, BPA free. Um, the truth is that um, you cannot make plastics without one of these compounds. So they don't have, now the plastic bottles don't have BPA, but instead they have BPS or BPF. So even if they say BPA free, uh, they still have something that does the same thing as BPA. Anyway, we take pregnant females um, when the embryo is developing in between days 7 and 13 of development. And I'll show you in a minute why that is. And we call the female that is exposed, we call, them, call it the um, F0 generation. Um, and we expose them to BPA for seven days. And then this embryo and the germline of this embryo are exposed to BPA. And when the embryo is born, we uh, cross it to another uh, mouse from a parallel exposure. So we are going to expose two different females and we take a male mouse from one female and a female mouse baby from the other female and we cross them, okay? And then they have babies. Um, so these guys are the F1 generation. The F0 is the exposed female. The progeny is the F1. The F1 uh, um, generation has normal weight. So as, a, as a, an outcome of this exposure, we are going to look at obesity. 
the truth is that these um, exposed animals and the progeny have all kinds of things. For example, they have increased um, increased um, incidence of testicular cancer, breast cancer. They display uh, alterations in social interactions that you could call um, autism-like um, behaviors and so on. But we are looking at obesity because really we are molecular biologists that don't understand very much about physiology. So for us, looking at a fat mouse is the easy thing. So the F1 has normal weight, as I'll show you in a minute, more or less. And the F2, and that means that the somatic cells of the embryo were not majorly affected by the exposure to BPA, at least, at least not in a way that would cause obesity. Um, now, we cross then uh, F1 from the left cross and the right cross, uh, the right uh, female, and we cross them uh, together to obtain the F2 generation. And the F2 generation is obese. And then the F3 generation is obese and the F4 generation is obese. So there's not an additional exposure. Only the F0 mother was exposed. But in the F2, you can see obesity um, as, as a phenotype in the, in the F2 generation, and that is transmitted from one generation to the next one. We can also do the crosses, um, uh, instead of doing intercrosses between the progeny of exposed females, we can do outcrosses, crossing them to unexposed animals. So if we take again the female exposed, then the F1 generation, if it's a female, we cross it to a uh, control non-exposed male, or if it's a male to a control non-exposed female. And then in the second generation, we see that the mice display obesity. That means that the, the epigenetic alteration that happened in the germline uh, that leads to obesity can be transmitted through either the sperm or the egg because it's transmitted through the female or the male germline, okay? So the question that we want to understand is how does that happen? What is happening to the germline that, that whatever alteration can be transmitted from one generation to the next one? So let me tell you a little bit about the peculiarities of the obese phenotype because I think they point us, they, they point in the direction of what is happening a, a little bit, as you would see towards the end. So this is what the mice look like. So this is a control mouse, and this is a, a mouse from the F4 generation, um, where the great-great-grandmother was exposed to BPA. You can see that it's not only, uh, it's not only obesity, but this mouse is bigger, it's longer, and um, so, so that means that the, the skeleton is longer, the muscles are developed um, more than in the control. So there's, uh, the, the phenotype is more complex. Um, but the mouse, the, the BPA mouse has more uh, visceral fat tissue. So if we open up the mouse, um, you can see that the, the tissue, the fat tissue that is in the abdominal part of the cavity, of the, ab of the abdominal cavity, you can see that there is more in the BPA than in the control. And you can express this um, by percentile with respect to the body weight of the animal. And you can see that the amount, the, the percentage of weight of the visceral white adipose tissue in the BPA with respect to the control is higher, okay? So we are going to focus on specifically trying to explain why they have more fat. And they have more fat, the adipocytes are bigger. So these cells here are adipocytes. You can see that they are bigger, so they are storing more fat. Um, and something that you cannot see here, but the cells that give rise to the adipocytes, which are the mesenchymal stem cells in the 
fat tissue, they have many more of those um, mesenchymal stem cells that will differentiate eventually into adipocytes. So I'm telling you all this because all of it is important in understanding what is happening uh, in terms of the question that we are interested in, which is, you know, what is happening to the chromatin, uh, to the epigenome that can be transmitted from one generation to the other. So this is what happens uh, from one generation to the next. This is the weight of control mice. Uh, this is the F1 generation. This is the weight of the F2, the F3, the F4. Now you see that after the F4, the weight starts coming down again. And by the F7 generation, it's the same as in the control. So whatever epigenetic alteration took place in the germline, it goes away eventually by the F7 generation. That means that the germline of the F6 generation is already normal. So if we take, if we call normal, um, if, if, if we call normal weight, the median of the weight of the controls plus minus one standard deviation. So if the weight is within that range, we call it normal. And if it's outside of that range, we call it obese. So this is the percentage of animals that are obese <clears throat> in blue from one generation to the other. So, you know, given the, the, the range of weights in the control, you can argue that some of them based on that definition um, are, are also obese. But the control and the F1 have very few obese individuals based on that definition of plus minus one standard deviation from the mean. And then the number of obese individuals goes up in the second, third, fourth, and then it starts coming down. And you can see that in the F7 is the same as the control. And the mice, when they are born, uh, this is not when they are born, but this is at, at three weeks of age, um, they weight the, the ones from that were exposed, the, the mother was exposed, or the grandmother was exposed to BPA. Um, you can see that they are not obese at that time, but then as they age, they become obese. So this is the control, this is the BPA. And you can see the effect is much stronger um, in the male than in the female. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> so, one possibility for all this that any, anybody would raise is that maybe the microbiome of the mother was affected, or maybe is the, the environment in, in the mother um, independent of the germline, but it's just the environment in the mother, either the microbiome or something else <clears throat> that is contributing to, to obesity. So to discard this possibility and, and really focus on the fact that it's the germline that is being altered, we took um, a female <clears throat> that, that is the F2 generation from a, a, a exposed uh, grandmother um, and isolated the oocytes from this female and do in vitro fertilization with sperm from a control male implanted this in a control female, and then we look at the progeny. And so this embryo have, have been, has been implanted into a female that never saw BPA or, or, or was a control unexposed. So uh, this says that the meeting will end in 10 minutes. I hope that it's not true. <clears throat> um, Okay, so what happened? So what we can see that is happening and I have to really hurry up and spend too much time. This is the embryo transfer experiment. This is the dark blue. This is control and, and the dark blue. So you can see that this embryo transfer experiment, the progeny is also obese. So we can say the, the obesity is due to an epigenetic alteration in the germline. It's not due to the environment of the mother. Um, 
Okay, I'm going to skip uh, through this, but essentially we've analyzed in detail why these mice are uh, uh, becoming fat. And what we have learned is that they are be becoming fat because the control mice normally spend the day sleeping more or less. But the BPA exposed mice uh, spend the day eating. So the control mice sleep during the day, they eat at night, the, the BPA mice eat all day long, and that's why they are becoming fat. Okay, so those are the uh, characteristics of, of the phenotype. Now, let's go back to try to explain um, why this phenotype arises and, and how it's transmitted. So this is a, a description of um, the development of the mouse embryo from fertilization here. Um, at day 7.5, the, the cells, the PGCs, the cells that are going to form the germline are, are forming in the extraembryonic mesoderm. And then they migrate to where the gonad is by day 10.5. And then uh, they um, develop into sperm or the oocytes this is when sex determination takes place. Now, during that time, um, the, the germline is uh, reprogrammed. So it's starting at day 7.5, the DNA methylation levels in the PGCs, the, 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 the progenitors of the germ cells, they, it starts going down. So we start injecting right at this time of development. And you can see this is the level of DNA methylation here. You can see that DNA methylation goes down progressively between day 7.5 and day 13.5. And this is exactly when we are exposing the mother so that the germline of the embryo um, is being exposed and is being exposed at, at a time when the DNA is demethylated. And we think that this is critical. And we can obtain exactly the same result if we only expose the, the uh, pregnant female one day of development at day 13.5. Exposing the female at this time when the DNA is completely demethylated um, causes the same obesity phenotype and is transmitted transgenerationally the same as exposing for seven days. So what we think is happening, and I'm, I'm going to um, uh, tell you about this uh, again, is that BPA, which is an estrogen-like substance, is um, binding to nuclear hormone receptors and is causing an alteration of transcription. And is happening at a time when the DNA is demethylated so that DNA binding proteins that normally wouldn't bind to certain sites in the genome because they are methylated, now they can bind because they are, uh, those sites are not methylated. And then those proteins are bound to the DNA at this time um, between day 13.5 and birth at the time when the DNA is becoming remethylated. But because the proteins are bound, they protect the DNA from remethylation so that the memory is a combination of DNA methylation and protein binding to DNA. If the proteins were not bound to the DNA, then when the, the methylation is erased and then re-established again, then the effect would uh, disappear. So, um, so in order to understand that this is possible, we need to, to think about the epigenome of the sperm. So we tend to think about the, the, the sperm as completely devoid of histones and nucleosomes and completely the DNA is completely um, covered by protamines. And we tend to think about sperm as a cell that doesn't have epigenetic information. But during the last few years, um, we've shown that this is not the case. And actually, the sperm genome um, has nucleosomes in all the places that are important 
uh, like flanking promoters, flanking enhancers, flanking uh, in present super enhancers, all those in, important regulatory sequences contain nucleosomes. Not only that, they contain the transcription complex and they contain different transcription factors. So the sperm is actually not that different from a normal cell in the sense that it, it has all the epigenetic information that a normal cell has. And important for what our interest, sperm also has CTCF, which um, uh, is a protein that is involved in organizing the three-dimensional um, chrom the, the chromatin fiber in th the three-dimensional space, and it allows, it, it regulates enhancer promoter interactions by doing this. Either brings enhancers close to the target promoters or interferes with the ability of an enhancer inside these loops to um, act on, on, on a promoter outside the loop. So CTCF regulates enhancer promoter interactions. Um, okay, so um, uh, just to um, uh, emphasize this again, so um, the, the fact that at this time of the, of the development of the germline, um, BPA induces the binding of new transcription factors to DNA that uh, new transcription factors that normally wouldn't be there because it's BPA is activating those transcription factors uh, and they bind to the DNA when it's demethylated and then when the DNA gets remethylated, they protect it from demethylation. And so all this, the model requires that this, um, this arrangement of the transcription of a new transcription factor bound uh, to a sequence can be transmitted from one generation to the next one. So uh, that's what I'm going to address right now. I'm going to skip through this. And I was telling you, so for example, this is a tax seek, um, this, uh, a tax seek in um, results, a, a chromatin ac ac accessibility in sperm promoters, uh, in the oocyte promo promoters, at the GV stage, which is in prophase and is not mature, and in the M2 stage, which is the one that is fertilized by sperm. So you can see that the, uh, there are a series of promoters out of all the possible promoters in the genome. There is a subset of them that are accessible to transposase in a sperm. And if you compare that with chip seek from RNA polymerase 2, you can see that those accessible promoters contain RNA polymerase too. So assuming that ATAC-seq is giving us a view of the occupancy of those promoters by the transcription complex represented by POL2, the same promoters uh, contain the transcription complex in the sperm and in the oocyte. And then if we look in the embryo, the same promoters are, are occupied um, by the transcription complex, and I, I'm extrapolating here. This is DNA seq data and is from Lou et al. That we've taken it from Lou et al. This is our data. This is their data. Assuming that DNA seq is uh, giving us the occupancy of Pol2 and the transcription complex, this is the paternal chromosome, the maternal chromosome in the zygote, the paternal chromosome, and the maternal chromosome. In, in the cycle later, uh, later in development, uh, the two cell stage, the eight cell stage, the moral stage. So it looks like whatever, is whatever promoters are occupied in the sperm and in the oocyte are also occupied in the embryo. Okay, so that means that occupancy by proteins in the DNA is transmitted from the germline to the embryo. And, and you can see this, the same thing if now we look, look at transcription factors bound to enhancers. So these are transcription factors bound to enhancers in the, uh, in the sperm. This is in the oocyte, uh, two different stages of oocyte. And if now we go to the, to, to the embryo, you see that the same, th the same uh, enhancers that are occupied by transcription factors in sperm and oocytes, so you, you see it's only the ones that are common to the sperm and oocytes. They're all also occupied during 
early development. So, and, and we can do the same thing uh, with a taxi, uh, I'm sorry, with CTCF, and we can do the same thing with, we can um, look at the, at, at the same question by um, uh, looking at, at, at um, specific transcription factors, and these are results from high C showing interactions between enhancers and promoters um, um, that are occupied by these transcription factors, FOXA1, which is a pioneer factor that is necessary for the binding of estrogen receptor, which presumably is the target of BPA. Um, and, and so this represents interactions that are present in the sperm between enhancers and promoters occupied by these transcription factors. And, and you can see um, that these interactions from high C data are also present during embryonic development. And um, the same is true for interactions mediated by CTCF. So just to summarize this um, uh, information, what it means is that transcription factors that are bound to the genome in the sperm are transmitted to the embryo. Uh, not all of them, but a subset, and I didn't show you the, um, the data for this, but we think that the subset that is transmitted from the sperm to the embryo uh, is flanked by nucleosomes containing H2AC. So not all the information in the sperm is transmitted to the embryo, but a subset of that. And the same is true for the oocyte and is also a subset of the information present on the oocyte. And that subset is whatever is common from in the sperm and the oocyte. But what is important for, for our case is that information, epigenetic information in the form of occupancy by transcription factors can be transmitted from the germline to the embryo. So that if we think about the environment affecting the germline by causing, causing changes in transcription and causing the binding of transcription factors to enhancers that normally are methylated but in that window of the development of the germline, they become demethylated. Those transcription factors now bind and that information is passed to the next generation. Now, you may ask me, you may ask me, uh, um, ask me, you know, that explains what is happening in the germline of the F1 generation, but how about the F2 um, generation when now BPA is not present there? the environmental insult is not present, it's not affecting the germline anymore. And I don't have a good explanation for why it's transmitting it in, in subsequent generations. Although maybe when we get to the end, maybe I, I can um, speculate um, more. So, um, so if we look now at the sperm of different generations, uh, F1, F2, F3, F4, and look for changes between um, the control sperm and the sperm from these different generations. Uh, by doing a taxic and looking at the lo at, at differences in, in, in accessible chromatin, you can see that there are many, many changes. So in, in this picture, all I'm showing you is changes between the control and the F1 sperm and what happens during, to those changes in subsequent generations. So you can see that there are many changes in the F1. Um, most of them are increased accessibility and many of them are maintained from one generation to the other. But if you look at this in detail, you can see that is, you know, some of them are lost, some of them is, is, is more complicated. These are the ataxic peaks that are at, that have a CTCF motif in, in the peak, suggesting that is a binding site for CTCF. So you can see that there are many changes at CTCF sites that happen in the F1 generation, and some of them are then maintained in, in other generations. So there is a, a huge change in, in CTCF um, and CTCF may be 
a special protein in this sense because it's binding to DNA. First of all, it's dependent on DNA methylation. And second, it binds to DNA very, uh, with very high affinity and high occupancy time. So a transcription factor with low residence time in the DNA, it may not be bound sufficiently to protect from DNA re remethylation. But CTCF, it has been shown that when it binds to DNA, it protects from remethylation. Um, so you can see these are all the sites uh, that are present in control and increase in, in BPA of the F3 generation that have a CTCF motif. And you can see if we do high C now in, a, in, in a sperm, you can see that this CTCF site, so you can see here, all the CTCF sites increase uh, with respect to the control, um, that they form new loops that were not present there before. So this dot here represents a loop between uh, this steep one gene and some other sequence here in the steep four gene um, and, and that um, uh, uh, presumably the formation of that loop uh, results in an interaction between regulatory sequences present in, in, in next to this gene and next to this gene, so that it would alter transcription. And if we look at all these sites, um, and now we do um, a meta-analysis of all those sites, so essentially what we are doing is taking all those sites and looking at the signal intensity um, in the control sperm and in the BPA sperm, the same way that here we are looking at just one case. Now we are looking at all these cases together. You can see by the intensity of this dot that, that the interactions between CTCF sites are increasing uh, quite a bit in BPA. So the treatment with BPA um, leads to uh, an increase in interactions between CTCF sites that presumably I, I showed you before, they are altering um, interactions between enhancers and promoters. And I showed you before, they can be transmitted to the next generation. Okay, so now we are going to look, you remember the ob obesity increased until the F4 generation and then started decreasing. So what happens if we look at all these attack seeks that are maintained, they are exactly the same. They are increasing F1, and then they are maintained through all these generations. And then in, and we find that there are 69 sites that are, uh, and, and they are these sites here, 69 sites that were not present in the control. They increase in the F1, and then they are maintained up to the F4 and they are either in intergenic regions or in introns. Um, presumably, they are enhancers based on their location. And now, if we look um, at those ataxic sites that appear, that increase um, in, in, in a sperm from BPA, mice, and in different generations, and we look at the motifs that are present under the summit of the ataxic peak, you can see that the most frequent motif is CTCF. And then all the proteins are related to either the, the BPA um, phenomenon or CTCF. So zinc finger 143 is a protein that colocalizes with CTCF. Um, BPA presumably binds to a nuclear hormone receptor and it's not very clear which one, if it's estrogen receptor or uh, estrogen-related receptor, uh, PPAR gamma, all these things are, are nuclear receptors, the androgen receptor that are presumably related to BPA. And then in order for these receptors to be recruited to chromatin, they need um, pioneer factors like the FOX uh, proteins um, that always colocalize with nuclear hormone receptors in the genome. So you can see that out of these 69 sites in that, that are elicited by treatment with BPA in the, in the sperm, and then they are maintained from one generation to the other, 
the transcription factors that are binding to those sites are sort of related to what we um, think is the biology of BPA. Um, so let me show you some examples. Um, so for example, this and, and, and those sites, those 69 sites are present next to genes that are related to obesity. I'll come back to this again. So this is a gene called TRAM2. You can see a CTCF site is not present in the control. So these are two replicates of the control. It's not present in the control, but it's present in two different replicates of the F1 sperm, the F2 sperm, the F3 sperm, okay? Um, this is an androgen receptor site that is not present in either replicate of the control, but is present F1, F2, F3. Uh, this is a SOX5 site um, that is present in an enhancer that has been characterized previously um, by Mantrop to be an adipocyte specific enhancer. And you can see that also is induced by BPA. So going back to this slide, uh, these results so far um, agree with this model. I haven't addressed the issue of DNA methylation, but I agree with this model that new transcription factors are binding to the germline and staying them from one generation to the next one. Now, what happens to DNA methylation? So if, if we look at DNA methylation um, using BSEq and trying to get very high resolution to, to be able to look at a specific basis, um, we find um, a lot of, so, so this is all the um, methylation genome-wide. These are uh, hypomethylated regions in, in BPA, and these are hypermethylated regions in BPA. Um, so if we look at them in a different uh, way, these are regions that become hypomethylated in BPA, and these are regions that, are, that become hypermethylated. So there are uh, 1,428 regions that become hypomethylated and uh, hypermethylated. So this is all, I believe this was the sperm from an F1 mouse. So these changes were maintained all the way to the fourth generation. And if you look where these um, differentially methylated regions are located, most of them are located either in distal intergenic regions or in introns. So presumably regulatory sequences. Now, it, it, if you now look at the overlap between the changes in ataxy and the changes in DNA methylation, that overlap obviously is, is just from the numbers that I've mentioned, is not perfect. So a lot of, some of the differentially methylated regions happen in regions of the sperm that contain transcription factors bound and presumably are enhancers. But many of them, although they happen in intergenic regions, we don't see ataxic peaks in the sperm, suggesting that they are not enhancers in the germline, but they could be enhancers some, some other time in development. But the, uh, the, there, there is an overlap. So for example, out of these 69 sites that I've told you that are conserved from one generation to the next one, out of these 69 sites, um, in 33 of them, uh, there is decreased DNA methylation. In 22 of them, there is increased DNA methylation. And in 10 of them, there is no change in DNA methylation. Um, and this is an example of one of them in this intron of this gene. Uh, so you can see there's no ataxic signal. It's a, it's a CTCF site. There's no ataxic signal in the control. Then there is ataxic signal uh, up to the F3, and then is hypo, there is hypomethylated, hy hypomethylation in the BPA with respect to the control. So the presence of a protein that we presume is CTCF because that's the binding motif that we find here, the presence of the bound protein correlates with a loss of DNA methylation. Okay, and, and this is just another example. Okay, so, so in general, the hypothesis, the model that I mentioned to you of binding of proteins 
um, concomitant, concomitant with loss of DNA methylation uh, to a certain extent appears to hold. It's, it's not a perfect correlation. There are all sites in the genome where that doesn't happen. Um, and so how, how do we narrow down the, the 69 sites? How, how do we figure out um, which ones of these are really uh, responsible or are all 69 responsible for this transmission? So you remember that after the F4 generation, um, the, the obesity starts decreasing and then the, in the F7 decreases completely, goes away completely, meaning the germline of the F6 should already show a loss of a toxic signal in genes that are not responsible for the epigenetic transmission of the phenotype. So if now we impose this new um, restriction that whatever ataxic change in whatever gene has to not be there in the control, then be there in the F1 to the F5 generations, and then disappear in the F6 generation, then we can narrow down this collection of 69 genes. In addition, we did this um, embryo transplant in which we took an oocyte from an exposed mother and um, a sperm from a non-exposed father, and then we put that into a pseudo-pregnant female and the progeny got fat. We can then, the, whatever is responsible should also be in this embryo transfer experiment progeny. So if we do all that, then we narrow down the number of candidate genes from 69 to, I forget what this is, I think it's 12, okay? So one of these genes is FTO. And so um, I guess I'm going to skip to the next slide. Um, so this is, we are looking, uh, to, to tell you this, we are looking at the transmission through the male germline, but I told you before, that we can transmit this phenotype through the female germline. So maybe we can narrow down this list of 12 if we now look at the female germline and we require that uh, this alteration here, for example, is also present in the female germline. So um, if we do that, then we end up with only one gene and that gene is FTO. So, um, so FTO, uh, as you may know, is a gene that is involved in demethylating M6A from RNA. And it's a gene that has been implicated in obesity because in humans, there are a lot of SNPs through the entrons of the FTO gene that, um, that, uh, are uh, uh, present in people, in obese people, but not control people. So you can see this is the uh, fourth intron of FTO. And you can see this is the CTCF site that we characterized initially, but actually there are a whole bunch of sites in this presumed enhancer region that increase in, 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 in accessibility from uh, CTCF. Uh, when the mice are fat and then decrease in the F6, and they are also present in this embryo transfer experiment. And these different sites uh, are binding sites for FOXA1, CTCF, estrogen receptor, alpha, PPAR gamma, which is a nuclear receptor involved in adipocyte development, androgen receptor, etc. And there is a correlation with DNA methylation. So let me show you the correlation with DNA methylation here. So if we look at the CTCF binding site, the CTCF binding site has a C at position um, two in the consensus sequence um, that in some uh, sites in the genome um, um, that have a G in the next base is, uh, forms a CPG that can be methylated. So if we do bisulfate sequencing in control animals, this C here is mostly unmethylated. 
in the BPA, F3 is completely un um, unmethylated. In control, it's mostly methylated. In the BPA, it's mostly unmethylated. And now if we look in the F6 generation, when now the germline, uh, the, the progeny in the F7 that come from the F6 germline um, is not fat anymore, you can see that it becomes bimethylated again. So there's a very good correlation between the methylation of this base and the binding of CTCF and the, um, the, the um, transmission of obesity. And as I told you before, we can see the same thing in, in, in the uh, all side. Um, and, and so this really points out to FTO being responsible for this effect. Now, if we do high C in control and um, uh, BPA animals in the sperm, we see that this side, so here is FTO, and this is the whole region around FTO. And this region contains two genes that are especially interesting that are called IRX3 and IRX5. And um, in humans, um, uh, people have shown that humans that have a SNP in the intron of FTO, uh, that SNP interacts less um, with IRX3 and IRX5. In, in, um, and, and this is um, this is um, a little confusing because in humans people have um, used alternative tissues. So this in humans happen in the cerebellar region. That's where people have studied this. But um, in, in any event, it seems that in humans, FTO, IRX3, and IRX5 are involved in, in the development of obesity based on SNPs in, in this region. And what we find is that there are epigenetic alterations in the intron of FTO, and that in, uh, intron represents an enhancer. And based on high C uh, uh, data, that enhancer interacts much str uh, more strongly with the FTO promoter, uh, with this region here that contains a gene uh, called RP grip that is involved in obesity, with IRX3 and IRX5 that are involved in, in obesity, and then with a series of genes here, some of them are involved in obesity too. And so the epigenetic alteration that leads to sort of uh, the activation of an enhancer in the sperm and remember, we don't care. I mean, the mice are not becoming fat because of what is happening in the sperm, but presumably these interactions and these epigenetic alterations are transmitted to the embryo. So what is, um, I'm a little confused as to when we should finish, but uh, I'm going to try to speed up. So uh, FTO seems to be the gene responsible for this. And FTO is an RNA demethylase. And if we look in a sperm, uh, we see that, uh, and we look at um, N6A levels um, and, 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 and to see what happens in BPA versus, uh, versus the control, you can see, so it's a demethylase. There is increased interactions and activation of an enhancer. So we presumably, the N6A levels would decrease. And that's what we see. And there's a, a few exceptions here. Um, and so, so, what is the consequence of that decrease in M6A demethylation? Um, so, Chuan Hess lab at the University of Chicago published this paper in Science, um, I don't know, six or eight months ago, showing that decrease in M6A levels in RNA increase the association of RNA with chromatin and led to um, opening of chromatin in certain regions of the genome. And they look at this um, not at a very detailed level, but, but mostly doing immunofluorescence. So, so we, we, we 
um, purified chromatin associated RNAs from sperm of control and BPA mice. So we are looking now at the RNAs that are associated very tightly with chromatin. And we look at the M6A levels in those chromatin associated RNAs. And this led us to an RNA, a non-coding RNA that is presumably an enhancer RNA that is present in this region between IRX3 and IRX5. So I've gone through this very quickly, but here is FTO, here is the enhancer that I've been telling you about. And now by looking at chromatin associated RNAs and those that decrease in M6A methylation, we find a new region here that's presumably an enhancer because it has a non-coding small RNA that is presumed to be an enhancer RNA. Now it, you can see here, this is the enhancer RNA in this region here. So it's present in the sperm of control and, and BPA. But in BPA, it's not methylated. The M6A uh, levels are very small, very uh, low compared to control. Um, and this agrees with the fact that FTO is a demethylase. Um, so if, if now we look at the ataxic um, signal, in this region, you can see that there are ataxic sites that increase in BPA. They are, they are present, um, they are already in control, but increase in BPA, the accessibility increases in F1 through F5, and then it decreases again in F6. So this sort of agrees with um, um, results from this paper uh, that I mentioned before, that the increase, um, decrease the methylation, decrease methylation um, in, in, in this enhancer correlates with increase in chromatin accessibility. And by looking at the high C, we can see that this enhancer um, contacts the promoters of IRX5 and also this enhancer of FTO and the promoter of FTO, which is over here. Okay, so um, let me um, um, suggest uh, a, a model for what is happening. So here is FTO, IRX3, here is the M6A enhancer next to IRX5, but this enhancer interacts with all these genes here. So we think that BPA in the germline causes an, an alteration of transcription. So you, you, now you have BPA, which is not normally there and is binding to some uh, nuclear hormone receptor. And in this case, um, PPAR gamma, um, I don't remember why I wrote here PPAR gamma since there, there are uh, other nuclear receptors, but BPA binds to uh, a nuclear hormone receptor and, and it binds to the enhancer of FTO at a site that is normally methylated, but during this window of development becomes demethylated. So it, it, it combined. And um, then it recruits um, CTCF and FOXA1 to these other sites. Um, and that results in increased interactions with the FTO promoter so that FTO increases in expression and also with IRX3 and IRX5 and with this enhancer. Um, we don't see a change in the expression of these genes. So what, what I'm suggesting is that this is setting up some, some interactions that are not functional in the germline, um, but then they are going to be transmitted to the embryo. Now, um, you have an, an overexpression of FTO in the germline, so this is important. And now you have more M6A demethylase, and that will then demethylate this enhancer RNA, which will cause now increased accessibility by allowing transcription factors to bind to the enhancer, maybe by recruiting them, um, like is, uh, you see here. And now this in, in turn increases interactions with all these genes that are in the vicinity. Now, 
Um, what is that is transmitted? So, so there are two possibilities. What I have been telling you until now is that what is transmitted is, it is the transcription factors bound to the DNA and the interactions between those transcription factors. That is transmitted through the paternal chromosome from the sperm to the embryo. But the fact that FTO is a RNA demethylase brings another level of complexity because it's also possible that what is transmitted is RNAs from the sperm that normally would have high levels of N6 methylation, and now they have low levels of N6 methylation. And those RNAs could be microRNAs, and, and it's been shown that levels of M6A um, affect the interaction of microRNAs with messenger RNAs and their translation and their degradation. Um, and also, um, it could be that some of these um, now M6A and methylated, demethylated RNAs are enhancer RNAs. So, so this complicates um, the phenomenon and the explanation, but it offers more possibilities of explaining what is going on. Um, I'm not, I'm, I'm just going to um, finish here. I'm not going to tell you this, but by showing you slides, but um, let me just tell you that there are two possibilities. One is that BP, uh, FTO was altered by FTO, by FTO was altered by BPA. And now these changes that I mentioned in the FTO gene are transmitted to the embryo, and then they are transmitted from one cell division to the next so that they are transmitted through embryogenesis and eventually they are present in the cells that are going to form the fat tissue and they alter gene expression in the fat tissue and they cause obesity. Um, it turns out that we don't see that. In other words, when we look at FTO chromatin accessibility using a taxic in FTO, either in adipocytes or in the mesenchymal stem cells that give rise to the adipocytes, we don't see any difference in either a taxic or if we do RNA-seq, we don't see any difference in, in gene expression of the FTO gene. What that suggests is that if the, what FTO is doing is, is doing something very early in development. And by the time we look at the adult tissues, uh, we, we, we don't see the effect. In other words, very early in development, FTO um, affects the expression of some other genes that are then misexpressed in the uh, adult tissues. And that seems to be what is happening. And I won't, you know, I had some genes in here. I won't show you this. Let me just con concentrate on, on this one. So one of those genes whose expression we see is altered both in the mesenchymal stem cells and in the adipocyte is leptin. So the hypothesis is that FTO did something to leptin at a point that we haven't explored yet because it was a, an earlier point in development, in embryonic development, not in the adult tissue. But what, what we can see is that leptin um, in control um, fat tissue or mesenchymal stem cells has an ataxic here that disappears in, um, in the F4 generation, is not present in the adipose tissue of the overweight sixth generation. Remember, in the sixth generation, some an, um, animals were fat and some animals were not. So in the fat animals is not present there. And then in the lean animals, in the animals that were not fat, uh, comes back. And this corresponds, so, so, and so this correlates with the, with the obesity. And this corresponds to a binding site for androgen receptor. And if we do chip seek with androgen receptor, we can see that is bound in this region, but in, in control, but it's not bound in BPA. Um, 
And so we think um, uh, that somehow this androgen receptor is normally inhibiting the expression of the leptin gene. So you can see in the fat animals, in the adipose tissue of the fat animals, leptin is expressed at much higher levels. And if we look at leptin levels in the blood of BPA, you can see that in fat animals in the fourth generation, overweight fat animals, there is more leptin than in the control. And also in the F6, in the overweight animals, there is more leptin than in the lean animals. Um, so this would suggest less than leptin controls appetite. And, and so this is more complicated. So leptin goes to the hypothalamus and it controls appetite. Um, we have not been able to find differences in the hypothalamus in the expression, for example, of the leptin receptor, which would be um, an explanation if the leptin receptor um, decreases in, 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 um, in expression, then the animals become, uh, become resistant to leptin. And that would explain why uh, we see, uh, why they eat all the time. That's why I spend so much time uh, telling you about the, the physiology of the, of the phenotype, because I told you the animals spend the day and the night eating. And I didn't um, show you this, but the way if, if you look at the energy consumption of the animals, what is happening is that because they eat all the time, they get all their energy from carbohydrates that they are eating and they don't mobilize the fat. And all that agrees with, with this observation that the leptin gene is overexpressed. Um, so, um, we cannot yet uh, explain very well the phenotype um, based on this. And we have to look at the hypothalamus in, in more detail. But let me just summarize, because I think I, I, I uh, didn't explain these things very well because I'm getting all uh, um, confused here. Uh, since I don't see faces, it's very hard to talk to yes. a computer <laughs> screen. If I don't see faces of people reacting to me, I can't tell if uh, I'm explaining things well or not. But essentially, this is um, what I want you to go home and tell your spouses. Um, so if an environmental effect um, causes a change in transcription in the germline at a window of development when the germline is being reprogrammed, and there are changes not only in DNA methylation, but in histone modifications at that time, that environmental effect can, af can, can affect the binding of transcription factors, which then, when bound to DNA, protect from remethylation of certain sequences, which normally would be methylated and during adult development wouldn't allow the binding of transcription factors. Now those regions become demethylated. And, and um, let me remind you again that this happens again after fertilization. The DNA gets demethylated and remethylated again. So the proteins serve as epigenetic memory because they are regulating the, methyl the methylation levels in the DNA during these transitions. But then later on is the DNA methylation that serves as a memory, at least that's what we think. Now, we think that these changes are affecting um, embryonic development very early. And the changes that you see in adult, that's all we can say from analyzing these um, this changes in, in, um, in, in the fat tissue. The changes that you see in the fat tissue or that you see in the brain have happened um, much earlier during embryonic development. And by the adult stage, the FTO gene it has already done its thing and it's not, it, it has activated certain genes and it's not doing anything in, anymore. Um, so let me just uh, finish by um, by acknowledging that most of this work was done by a postdoc in the lab named Yunhee Jang and um, uh, a few other people in the lab helped her with a few things. 
Um, and um, we've worked all our lives with Drosophila and we don't, didn't know how to isolate all sites, for example, and Anthony Chan and uh, his uh, postdoc, uh, Pui, um, help us a lot uh, with the uh, embryonic, with the aspects of embryonic development and germline development in the mice. So thank you. I'm sorry I went over uh, in time, but I got confused with all these uh, things. Yeah. Anyway, so, <laughs> thanks. Oh, thank you, thank you very much, Victor. Um, I, well, I guess I'm, um, yeah, I will be so, not, so I, sorry, we cannot clap. Uh, is, I, I imagine how strange must be to give a talk like this and not uh, having a feedback, especially because this is a really complicated uh, story. Which, yeah. uh, I, well, I found, I told you this before, when I, the first time I listened to part of it, because you, you have more, much more data now, that I found amazing that you can nail down, uh, starting from the methylation changes in the in the uh, germline to really find a few transcription factors and narrow down till one that um, can act as an enhancer and uh, enhance even the activity of this demethylases. Amazing, uh, beautiful work. And um, probably the most uh, striking lesson to get home, home is that we should we females should protect our embryos when uh, we are pregnant uh, very, very early. Yeah. And, uh, th I guess this, this is one of the alterations that you follow, but so many can happen, especially if uh, the, um, the germline of the embryo is so uh, fragile at this particular window of development that uh, so, so many things can happen. Yeah. So, uh, can I ask you something about, about FTO then? The, the, I guess, because, uh, yeah, so when, when you did the, your, your chromatin and rich RNA samples, I guess you find others as well, because being general demethylase would, have, would affect, uh, so do you think that, um, so FTO is, is uh, upregulated, but also you have this enhancer RNA that is being probably now being produced because the enhancer is active through, through, through the loop. But mm -hmm. so you think that then FTO just acts on um, demethylation a lot of RNAs that present at that time, so it can have more effects on some of the other scenarios as well. So did you find any other enhancer RNAs that are demethylated uh, when you expose the, the, in the sperm of the exposed uh, animals? So we find more enhancer RNAs um, next to other genes, but you know, it, it, it's very difficult to know if, if it means something or not. So, so a lot of the genes, you know, um, they have not been characterized in detail and people don't really know what they do. So, uh, so yeah, yeah. yes, we find other enhancer RNAs, but we don't know if they are important for this phenomenon or not. Uh, but maybe to, for some others that occur, if you if you are correct or how, although I know it's difficult to know, yeah, which are the different factors that have been transmitted. But if this uh, this can have another effect on other parts of the genome as well, that can have yes, uh, absolutely, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. But yeah, yeah. Well, it's amazing that you even can find enhanced RNAs from tiny amounts of sperm in any case, bound to chromatin, that's pretty, pretty amazing itself. And I mean, another complication of the whole system is that in a sperm, there is no transcription. And, you know, the, the last stage of a spermatogenesis that is easy to study really is round spermatids. But there are, you know, between round spermatids and sperm, there are 12 days of development. So in those 12 days, it's hard to know, it's, it's, it's hard to isolate pure populations of cells to, to understand what, what kind of changes in transcription are taking place during that time. So something is happening then, and then by the time we get to the sperm, the sperm doesn't transcribe anything. It's not transcribing. So something has already happening and we just see 
the consequence of of that. Yeah, yeah. Um, anyway. Complicated. So I, I re read you some of, of the questions. So Santiago Lamas uh, asked uh, to before before they stopped and uh, also after one. So before the, the, we have the, this this uh, problem, he said thanks. So for a wonderful webinar. Two questions. Does this mean that Lamarck has a point on the inheritance of acquired characters? And does BPA modify the circadian rhythm? Uh, you mean, okay, Lamarck, I, I guess, you know, people are talking about this. It has a point for seven generations. I don't, I don't know. Um, I, I guess you could argue that these epigenetic changes caused by the environment, at least um, they give a window for genetics to act in a selective manner. Um, so, um, I, I guess you can argue that Lamarck had a point. Um, but is it altering the circadian rhythm? Uh, we haven't looked into this. You mean it's altering the circadian rhythms, and, and that's why, um, the mice are staying up during the day eating because they are bored. Uh, it's like uh, it's like being in, at home in quarantine during the coronavirus. Um, maybe we haven't looked into that, but but maybe. Yeah, I I don't know. We at least I am um, confused as to what we should do next. In other words, you know, our original interest is just trying to understand whether 3D chromatin organization has a role in transgenerational transmission of information. But now we find all these interesting phenotypic um, events um, that are very interesting, but, but we don't have the expertise in in this field, so looking at the at this at circadian rhythms, I, I think is an interesting question. I, mean, I hadn't thought about that. Maybe we should look into that. Yeah. So he also says, "Well, wonderful talk. Thanks. This is at the end. Uh, still, it's difficult to understand how attack six dis uh, signals disappear after F F four, allowing the epigenetic effects on leptin to fade away." Yeah, I, we don't, you know, they, they, we don't, I don't have an explanation for, for why it disappears, why it increases and then it decreases. It, 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 you know, it, it, it could be, um, so all these processes are stochastic and um, I, I don't know, I kind of speculate on hand wave and stuff like that, but I don't have a good explanation why, no. And do you think it, that um, and then uh, yeah, yeah. DNA bound by a long encoding RNA can give an imprint, give an imprint for a uh, protection, or is just proteins. Hold on a second, because at least for me, you froze for a uh, for a second there, and I missed something. No, I just ask if it's known that if um, imagine that. Um, yeah, structural RNAs that are bound to chromatin, in the, if they can protect from uh, attack sec. Uh, yeah. Uh, Is it known? No, I, I don't know. It's not known, but according to this paper in Science that I mentioned, is it, they argue the opposite, that the present, well, um, I, I guess the idea, yeah, uh, um, that is not known. Your specific question is not known. In the case, they argue that with the same RNA, but unmethylated, then the chromatin is more accessible. You know, it, it that's not really what is happening, right? So you could argue, for example, M6A, it, there are proteins that are known to interact with M6A. So M6A may recruit those proteins, and then those proteins recruit other you know, histone acetylases or methyltransferases or nucleosome remodeling complexes, and then allow the binding of transcription factors. I think this is, you know, that's a very interesting, I think it's a very interesting field that is not very well um, understood or even explored. 
it, you know, how the RNA is bound to the chromatin, is it forming a triplex with the DNA? Uh, how does it affect binding of proteins? Um, I don't know. I think that's a very interesting area. Yeah. So, um, I don't know, probably, yeah, it, it's probably late. I don't know if people is, are still connected or not. <laughs> um, well, there still are 70 people connected. Um, I had to say that there were a few hundreds, a few times that I checked. But, uh, because, yeah, with these problems, I don't know how, how it went. I, I'll tell you uh, afterwards when we know. So, yeah, I don't know. From my side, if there is no more questions, I will talking to you in private now <laughs> i don't know if anybody else you have still some some questions to ask people looking live uh, okay there's another chat they are telling me sorry uh what is the other one no, ah, yeah that's, that's what i thought yes okay um uh, Okay, thank you very much to, especially to Victor. I, I can clap just on my own here. And thanks for all of you listening. Um, I will have some feedback, I, I'll let you know. I think it was an amazing talk. Uh, so thank you very much. And I hope to you, we can see you in person in another time. You are will be always very welcome to the city and you can give another talk, even the same one, uh, whenever you want. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Victor.